introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Ona, and today I'll be talking to you about how linguists can be scientists too. For that, first we need to go back to 2012, when I finished my high school studies. There, I was really enjoying both languages and science, but I, w I found myself in a dilemma, because I had to choose one and only one. In the end, I did linguistics. However, I was still feeling a bit resentful that I had to choose only one. Nonetheless, a bit later, in 2016, when I finished my bachelor's studies, I discovered that these two were not actually enemies and that they were really good friends in a discipline called natural language processing, NLP for short. The same way I got to know NLP at that time, I wanted to introduce to you, to you today. NLP is a subfield of linguistics, computer science, and artificial intelligence, and mostly it is concerned in how to program computers to process large amounts of data coming from natural language in order to build applications. And I know, I'm sure you're thinking, this is too abstract and has nothing to do with me. But actually, NLP is everywhere. Let me show you some examples. When we run a Google search and we get some options, those are prompted by NLP statistics. Same happens when we are actually writing an email or a report and Grammarly corrects our words. Another example is in our inboxes. The spam filter that detects if an email is spam or ham is based on the words that that email contains. A very famous one are the virtual assistants. Siri, Alexa, Cortana, and so on. They are able to recognize our voice and to give us answers about the world. However, the most famous and the ultimate NLP application is probably machine translation, software that translates text from one language into another. And today, I'm going to talk to you about it. How does it actually work? Well, MT is based in existing human translations. So we have the same text in English, for example, as in that case, and also in Basque. And that is fed to an empty system. But what's inside this empty system? Well, for that, we need to go back in time and to another era. First, let's get started with the 1960s. In the 1960s, the rule-based systems appeared. These were based on bilingual dictionaries as to manzana is translated to apple, for example, and also of, in lots of rules that were manually written by linguists, such as um, the plural of corpus is corpora, not corpuses. With that, we were able to build very simple systems, but these were very expensive in terms of resources, because we needed lots of linguists doing manual work, and also they didn't cover many languages or many linguistic phenomena. So we were not happy with them. A bit later, with the arrival of machine learning in the 1990s, the statistical systems appeared. These were based on these human existing translations and on their counts. So if we have a word or a phrase that has been translated as X that many times, we just output the one with a ma maximum probability. Let me show you an example. So if we have that D can be translated as thus or a house, we see that the probability for thus is much higher, almost 0.6, while the probability to be translated as house is much, much lower, 0.02. So thus is what we're going to choose. But still, these systems were lacking to capture long-distance relationships within a sentence. So in the end, the real question was, can we capture meaning? Will machines ever be able to mimic human thought? Well, I'm not going to dare answering that question, but what I can tell you is that in the last decade, so there has been an increase in the development of systems for NLP, especially with the arrival of neural networks, not only in our field, but in many other fields. Neural networks are able to mimic the semantics behind, behind natural language, and that's why we're getting extremely good results with those. So now that we have traveled back in time, if we go back to today, how does this relate to what I'm currently doing at the VSC nowadays? Well, my team and I are working on developing empty systems for low resource languages. Low resource languages are those languages that lack sufficient data, meaning text, to build supervised machine learning systems. In this case, these are the languages we're working with, and actually, Five of them have been classified as a, by a study recently conducted by Metanet as in danger of digital extinction, just like our koala here.
Therefore, it is very important to build systems to keep these systems alive, to keep these languages alive, pardon me. But how do we do that? We said that we build empty systems based on human translations, and we don't have those translations for these languages. So what we're working on is unsupervised empty systems. By unsupervised, we mean that we don't rely on this parallel text, meaning the same sentence in one language and in another language, but rather we have different texts. We have one text in English talking about something and one text in this case, for example, in Catalan talking about something else, and they are not related to each other. And with that, with large amounts of data, we're able to build an empty system. Isn't that exciting to be able to build systems for languages that don't necessarily share content together? Well, for us, it is very much so. And actually, we believe that by building these systems, we're contributing to the survival of these languages in the digital era. We're actually allowing users to communicate in their own language without having to use a global one, for example. I must confess that sometimes, if I want to look something up on a browser, I may look for it in Spanish, expecting to get more results. However, I would like to do so in Catalan, my native tongue. And finally, this translates to the democratization of technology. We're expanding the reach of knowledge to everyone, independently of their mother tongue. And now, finally, to sum up, the question that brought us here in the beginning. Are linguists scientists? Well, let's look at the definition of scientist. Scientist is someone who gathers research and evidence, makes a hypothesis, tests it, and then gains some knowledge. Do we do that? Well, we collect data. Our data are not numbers, they are letters, but it is data anyways, right? We process it and clean it, remove noisy um, sentences. We actually decide what models to train with it, we run experiments, and then we evaluate it. So now, I have a question for you. If we do everything that scientists do, aren't we scientists too? I hope that I have convinced you and that the next time you tell your kids, draw a scientist, this will pop up in their minds. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much for having me today and have a nice day. Thank you.